how you live like you're dying. What, what does that look like? What, is, what did Jesus do when it was the final hours of his life? If you would switch your... Uh, I'm switching my technology, but if you have your Bible, switch to uh, 14.1. And it's a verse that many of us grew up hearing. Jesus just got done talking to them about serving them, being on his knees. He's been telling them for a long time now he's going to die, that this, this thing is coming. And then he says this. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, so believe in me too. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If that wasn't true, I would have told you. But the reason I'm going is I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, and I do prepare a place for you, then I'm going to come back and take you with me so that you can be with me where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. In, 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 in the story of Easter, before Christ goes through one of the most painful things any human being could go through, I love that he looks in the eyes of his followers and he says, don't be worried. In the Easter story, you see the heart of the parent. You see the heart of the father looking into the eyes of his kids. And you see the heart of a pure and true father. A good father. And he looks into the eyes of these men and he says, Don't be worried. It's okay. You know, those of you that are parents, you understand this maybe a little bit. You understand when you have to leave your child at daycare for the first time and they are scared to death. And you say, It's okay, Daddy, you'll be back. I remember very well the first day I left Drew and I left Emily at daycare. It broke my heart. I, I, I cried on the way home back to work because it was the hardest thing for me to do. But I knew in my heart. And I looked him in the eye and I looked Emily in the eye. And when I said it, I meant it. Daddy will be back. And I think that's the story. Jesus looks into their eyes and he goes, it's okay. Daddy will be back. Another thing that's really cool about the story that I think sometimes we miss is in verse 6 and 7. And he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him. And you have seen him. Jesus was the total package. And verses 9 through 14, you can skim that as I share this with you. Then he went on to tell them and us, we have more power than we could ever imagine. This is that verse in Scripture, maybe some of you have heard a pastor reference before, where he says, well, you know, Jesus said we could do greater things even than he did. It's right here, in Jesus' words. Do you know what Jesus did? Mm. Jesus rose people from the dead. Last time I checked, I haven't met anybody, even Benny Hinn, that could do that. Jesus healed people of sickness from a distance. The story of the Roman centurion, you know, who came to Jesus and he's like, Jesus, please, my daughter is sick. Can you please, just, just the faith. I could go on for hours about the faith that this Roman centurion had to have had to approach this Jewish nobody, probably in the views of the Romans. My daughter is sick. And Jesus goes, your faith has made her well. The story of the woman where Jesus is walking through a crowd and all she does is touch the hem of his garment. And she's healed. And Jesus goes, wait, somebody touched me. And his disciples are like, are you nuts? Of course somebody touched you. You're in a crowd of like a thousand people. He's like, no, 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 no. no. I felt power go out of me. Or perhaps my favorite story of the Gospels, one that I don't know why it keeps coming back up in my life, but it does. I mean, there's something in it for me there. The story of the apostles in the boat in the stormy sea. If I could, I want to take two minutes on that story. You, you know what half those apostles did for a living pre-Jesus, right? About half of them. Fishermen. So. What were they? Fishermen. Fishermen. Who lived, many of them, near the Sea of Galilee. And had fished on this sea probably hundreds, if not thousands of times, cumulatively. Statistics go, they probably weren't a few bad storms in their day. 
And then they get on this boat, and Jesus falls asleep, and there's this storm, apparently, like none other. And they just freak out. And, and I love the story because it's funny to me. Anthony was talking about a couple weeks ago, and it just amuses me because they, they had the thought to talk to Jesus and be like, Yo, why are you sleeping? But then when he calmed the waves, they're like, How'd you do that? Why'd you wake him up if you didn't think he could do that? But this is a man who stood in the bow of a boat. And, and some of your versions of the Bible, I think it's uh, New King James does, and maybe American Standard does too. I love it. <laughs> because he says, And Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves. I love that. You know, you know some verses like, He said, Be still. Okay, well, that may, be, that may very well be exactly what he said. I'm sure it is. I'm not questioning that. But I love the idea that he rebuked them. That he, he not only, by the very words of his mouth, was able to make the wind and the waves stop it, but that he came to the table with such authority that he looked at the wind and the waves and he said, Knock it off! <laughs> and it was done. And be still. I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's sacrilegious to say he said shut up, but it's probably something close to that. If you, if you rebuke, I, the last time I met a parent that was rebuking his kids, they didn't really go, be still. <laughs> when you rebuke, you rebuke. Parents, can I get a witness? Yeah. Hey, man. quiet. <laughs> That's rebuking, right? Shut and then you come back to the story, and he's with his disciples, he goes, I tell you what, you can do greater things than I did. And come on, these guys were there. They were in that boat, they're like, say what? Because you're the dude that said, shut up to the wind and the waves. That never worked for me. <laughs> so, but I'm telling you, listen, you can do greater things than I did. Then in verse 15, just sharing a personal opinion now, this is one of the passages of Scripture that I think a lot of us in the modern church don't like a whole lot. I know I don't like it. Um, I wrestle with it. We, we say it all the time, but I don't know that we like it. If you love me, obey my commands. Something else you learn from this man who knew he was living like he was dying. Something else you learn from this man that was the last week of his life. He was God and man incarnate. And he was trying to get some final thoughts into his believers' heads, into his disciples' heads, and he looked at them and he said, with relationship comes responsibility. It's right here. I'm not making that up. And actually, that's also found in this story in verses 19 through 24. He comes back to it. And then if you read chapter 15, he says it again. Three or four times in this in this time. And it's not a sermon either, guys. He's actually hanging out with his disciples. It's the last time they will all be together. Well, if you realize that, he takes a couple of his disciples with him to Gethsemane, but this is the last time they will all be together in this way ever again. And he's trying to stuff some final stuff in their hearts and in their minds. Again, we're talking about, you know, how do you, how do you live like you're dying? What does it look like? What are some things that a person who believes this gospel message, that believes that Jesus is coming back, that believes that there's hope, and believes that there's hope beyond the grave, but you don't know how much time you live. What does that look like? How do you live a life like that? He looked in their eyes and he said, with relationship comes responsibility. He even said it earlier with the whole, you know, I command you to love each other. Because if you love each other, that's how people are going to know your mind, if you love each other. And then he goes on and he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 16 and 17. Earlier I was praying for the brokenhearted, and if that's you today, I really hope you will listen to these verses. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. For some of your verses say comforter, scriptures say comforter, to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. Jesus knew he was leaving, but he promised comfort in his absence. Tim and Melissa and I, um, we were kind of worshiping together, really, even though it wasn't the plan the other night. And we're talking about how sometimes I think we're scared of the Holy Spirit. 
we're really good with God because he's the guy that the Bible says spoke life into existence. And we're pretty sure we can't do that. So we're cool with him. We're good with Jesus because he was God and man. He was incarnate. He came. He lived. He died. He was resurrected. He went back to heaven. Okay, none of us in this room are all that able to do that. So we're pretty okay with Jesus. But I wonder how okay we are with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, is there to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment, the problem is we'd rather do that. Often we don't like the Holy Spirit because He does the job we think we're called to do. And it's interesting when Jesus introduces to His disciples the concept of the Holy Spirit, one of the first things He says is he says, I'm going to send you a comforter. And then in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. There's a heart of a father again. He's looking in the eyes of his kids and they're, and they're scared because he's telling them he's going to leave. Daddy's going away. Obviously, you know, the disciples didn't think of Jesus as daddy, but I think you understand the analogy. I'm leaving and they're scared. And he says, but don't be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me too. And he goes on later, he says, I'm going to send you a comforter and I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'll be back. I doubt there's any one of us in this room that would leave our kids at daycare and never come back. When I take Jordan Lee to Caldwell Adventist with my friend Vicki, who I see back there, she's fantastic. I couldn't be happier about who my kid's teacher is. But I'm not going to leave them with her all day. I'm going to come back and get them because they're my kids my kids. And he says, I'm going to send you a comforter, but don't be scared. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. That heart of a father is just so amazing. If you read on the story a little bit longer, and we're almost done, he refers to the Holy Spirit as an advocate. Anybody ever been in a place where you need an advocate? something that I think will take us an eternity to figure out. That's probably why heaven is an eternity because our brains need that much time. Um, It's the idea that from Genesis to Revelation, the entire body of scripture, we like to call it the canon, not the, anyway, um, is the idea that we needed an advocate. The entire Old Testament sanctuary was based around the idea that we had to have an advocate. The Easter story is the story of Christ himself, God's only son, saying, I want to bridge that gap, and I want to come and stand in that gap. And then when I return to my Father, I'm going to leave you someone who's going to be your advocate, that when you come to God and you've blown it. Anybody blown it? Right? (laughs) Right? When you've blown it, which is, you know, hourly. I'm going to have somebody put in place that all you got to do is say, hey, I need your help, and he's right there. As part of this triune concept, God, Father, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to be an advocate for you. Verse 27, towards the end of this chapter. It says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I don't give you peace as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You heard me say, verse 28, I'm going away, and I am coming back for you. That'd be a good place for, thank you, Jesus. Anyway, if you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. These are just the opening scenes of the Easter story. This is a man who's also God looking into the eyes of human beings, he knows that the end is drawing near. And what does he do? He serves them. He puts their needs above his own. He reminds them that there's peace. He tells them they will always have help. He promises that he's leaving because he's got to go. Daddy's got to go. i got to go do this for you so that when I'm done, I can come get you and we can go have fun together. He promises that in his absence we will have peace and that we will have power available to us beyond anything we can ask, think, or imagine. 
And then he says, I'm going to be back. And I think maybe that's the part that speaks to my heart personally the most. Growing up as a Seventh-day Adventist. Because in our very name is the word Advent. Return. Coming. Without the first one, you don't really have the second one. This weekend, and by the way, for those of you that are calendar geeks, we actually probably have the date right for this one. (laughs) Unlike Christmas, I love Christmas, don't get me wrong, but the, the date is a little broken. This time of year represents the story of a man who led his life in such a way that he left an example for us of what a life lived like, looks like, when it's lived knowing you're dying. But he knew he was dying for you and me. That was so incredible. Jesus lived a life of service for you and for me. This weekend represents a gift that you, frankly, and I did not deserve at all. Uh, the, the Bible actually teaches we deserve not to even be here. To be dead. You can actually find in Scripture where it, it refers to the Holy Spirit as the sustainer. That through Him we have our very breath. Without the Holy Spirit we don't breathe. That God sustains life. And, and we live in a world where almost it seems like hourly, minute by minute, more and more, we believe less and less in the power of God. This weekend represents something the human mind cannot explain, and that is a God who loved us so much that he died for us in spite of ourselves. Greater love has no man than this, that he would lay his life down for his friends. Paul talked about Jesus, as we close here, and something I thought was amazing that Paul said about Christ in his life is he said, Sometimes, a man might lay down his life for his friend. Probably not for a stranger. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. This is not a word. But for a friend, maybe. But Christ demonstrated his love for us in this one act. That while we were still sinning, he died for us. That's a perfect love, if you ask me. A love that looks in our eyes and goes, yeah, I know you. I know you're broken. And frankly, I know you're going to keep sinning. Um, I know you're going to keep screwing up. And I know that it's possible you might keep doing that very thing that you know is destroying you. You will never, on your own, fix it. You will never, on your own, be strong enough to make it right. The only answer is for the one who created life to let it be taken away so that the penalty for your mistakes could be forever paid. That's the man we claim to follow. The name Christian means follower of Christ. This man came and he lived his entire life knowing he was dying. Yeah, we all know we're going to die. You know, birth, to, birth is the beginning of death, but this is a different concept. Knowing, knowing he was going to willfully die, that he was actually going to willfully give his life for people who wanted him dead and had no intention of changing their ways, many of them. You don't believe that? Well, go home and read the rest of the Easter story. Um, I'm, I'm not going to do it today because of time, but... I have a clip of the Passion of the Christ. And, um, well, it's 20 minutes long. Uh, If you've never watched the movie, The Passion of the Christ, I don't recommend it for small kids. No freaky deaky. But I will tell you this. We really love to sterilize the story of Easter. Nothing sterile about it. 
was miserable, it was painful, it was heartbreaking, it was tear-wrenching. Mary watched her one and only son give his life for people who didn't care. God, the creator of the universe, who spoke life into existence, watched his only son die and intentionally did nothing to stop. Christ hanging on the cross. Final thought for you today. Christ hanging on the cross. The one that the Bible teaches us was both fully God and fully man who had the authority of heaven at his fingertips. Hanging on a cross with nails through his wrists and his ankles, barely able to breathe, looked down upon the very people he came to save, the very people that you and I are just like, by the way. I love how we love to like indict the Pharisees and talk about how bad and awful they were. We're just like them. We are them. They looked up at him, they mocked him, and here's what the Pharisees said to Jesus. They said, if you really are the Son of God, Anybody know the rest of that? Come down Save from the yourself. cross. Yeah. Careful what you ask for, by the way. I think that speaks to the character of Jesus, too. Because he could have. It's actually not a temptation for you and I. We couldn't have turned the bread into stone. We couldn't have jumped off the building and been saved by angels. Commanded angels. But Jesus could. Think on that today. Think on the kind of love that would willfully give its life to die. And and think on the kind of love that would harness the very power you and I wish we had and restrain it and do nothing and willfully die when all he had to do was that and start all over. That's how much you love. So much you love.